We will acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today um, and also pay respects to elders, past, present, emerging. And today we have uh, preliminary results and discoveries from implementing an alcohol and drug capacity building initiative in Logan. And the person who's presenting, we're very fortunate to have James Hoey. Thank you, Rod, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, here in the city and for those who are uh, webbing in. I guess um, coming to the Temple of Training today to talk about alcohol and drug training is a little bit uh, overwhelming in some ways, but uh, hopefully we can, I guess, explore some of the, uh, the ways that we've been working and uh, certainly uh, share those experiences and key learnings from it. With acknowledgements, I'd also, at this point, probably like to acknowledge a couple of colleagues who've been involved in this project. Uh, my fellow researcher in this area, Marianne Wider, our senior addiction and mental health uh, research fellow, who's uh, assisted in, uh, in some of this work, as well as also my colleague, Kelly Watkins, who was involved very much in the initial project development of this, uh, of this initiative. Basically, where we've come from and why I've called it not Drugs 101, that's, uh, that's like, you know, when you get these sort of uh, little tasks and assignments to put together a bit of a presentation, you sort of do all the work in the presentation and then at the very end you've got to kind of come up with something really Gucci in terms of, a, a, you know, sort of a title. I always struggle with that bit, so this title's changed many times, but uh, if it doesn't make sense now, I hope it does by the end of the presentation. Sam Levinson, who was active pretty much in the sort of 30s and 40s as a journalist and a, uh, and a uh, comedian and a radio commentator. I like his uh, take on life and that's part of why we're here today because if nothing else, while I can talk about our model and our, and our early findings and where we're going to from here, I'd really like to, I suppose, make this about inspiring uh, what opportunities there might be out there for people to be able to do even little bits of this type of uh, work and this type of initiative, mainly because of uh, not only building the capacity in organisations and developing partnerships, but also being able to create opportunities for better responses for individuals and for families and communities that are experiencing harm. So that's probably my main goal of today, and hopefully we'll meet that. So I'm obviously part of Metro South Health, and then narrowing that going down the funnel in, as part of the Addiction and Mental Health Service and in particular the, uh, the Addictions uh, Academic and Clinical Unit which basically oversees our clinics on the ground down there in Metro South and a couple of new initiatives and part of what I'm involved in is an initiative that's come out of the state government funding in 2015 around the crystal methamphetamine response and how our district has chosen to use that funding uh, has been in, a, in trying to be a little bit sort of creative and what I'm going to share today is the origins of this particular project that came out of that funding, the model that we're using, some of those preliminary outcomes as I mentioned and then the key learnings from that and certainly we'll have time at the end for any questions that people have but probably not particularly that one would be helpful in terms of my knowledge. Okay, so Logan, just in case there's uh, people from around our great state who are tuning in, is a, is a city that's kind of in between Brisbane and then the more commonly known Gold Coast. It's a population of a little over 300,000, uh, a large area of, uh, uh, represented by over 200 cultural groups. One of the, the key uh, sort of things that Logan is, Logan is known for is being quite culturally diverse. Over time, due to a range of different uh, policies, historical uh, mainly, it is also an area that has quite a large uh, concentration of uh, services, both government and non-government, which is part of the wh uh, reason why our service and uh, this program developed. Underpinned by some of the framework that came out of the National Alcohol and Drug Workforce Development Strategy 2015 to 18, there's a number of key recommendations and outcomes in that particular overarching document talking about workforce development and strategies to increase capacity to respond to alcohol and uh, drug related harm. One of them, outcome 10, in particular was, was uh, kind of targeting and, and suggesting that that work done with uh, the non-government community who didn't have a specialist 
alcohol and drug response would be a good use of time and resources and focus if we're going to broaden that base. Because technically, in many ways, these people are the frontline workers in a lot of cases around drug and alcohol. Tier one there, we have our specialist clinics who are, sorry, our tier four there, the specialist clinics, probably a lot of what we're involved with. But certainly there's that whole group of people who uh, maybe don't have the funding or they don't have specific roles. And that's the language I'm going to use today around generalist and specialist. But I in no way mean that generalist refers to the fact that these agencies don't have their own specialties. It's just in relation to their alcohol and drug response. So this project that uh, we've been undertaking down in Metro South has been particularly aimed at how do we actually go out to that group and how do we partner with them in a way that creates meaningful impact in terms of their capacity with people walking in their doors, people who are their clients uh, who might be experiencing alcohol and drug related harm. So in terms of our, I guess, mission statement or objective or key objective, if you like, of what we try, what we've tried to do through this project is to enhance that capability of these agencies. And it's been focused on Logan at this time, more in this kind of development uh, stage so that we can actually get the learnings, get the runs on the board. And we've got several more stages to go through in terms of consultation and expansion. But where we're at at the moment is that uh, to create these sort of initiatives, we really didn't want to kind of, I mean, I guess it's easy to talk about training and education, but we really wanted to look initially at the fact of how do you actually get implementation? How do you actually change practice on the ground? Uh, because that's a bit of a whole different story. And we decided in, uh, because of, uh, I guess, a lot of the work that my colleague Marianne Wider has been doing within our service, to use a bit of a tool, if you like, a, from principles from the implementi implementation science field, we used a tool called the Parish Framework, which is promoting action on research and implementation in health services. They've got a nice little formula that successful in, uh, implementation is equal to the function of evidence, context and facilitation, which didn't mean a lot to me probably 12 months ago, but this is the good thing in our field, we can continue to learn. So in terms of what they mean by that, that if you're going to actually have the, maximise the opportunity to try and get innovation and practice change, there's a couple of elements you've got to look at. First one is evidence. And evidence, that's no surprise, I guess, to anyone we're talking about training, because evidence-based practice is at the core of what we do in our health field. But evidence in this definition is actually a little bit beyond just the codified sources of evidence. It's also looking at the non-codified. So yes, what does the research or the science say? But then actually, what does the what works principle say as well? So what is it that people will accept? What is it that practitioners will feel comfortable with? What is it that clients respond to? So it's a much broader picture. So we went on the hunt for that sort of information as part of our development of this initiative. Also an element of this uh, parish framework for successful Im implementation is you've kind of got to understand the context as well that you're working in. Uh, that comes down to things like organisational culture. It comes down to the environment, the inner and the outer kind of context of different agencies. Is there a culture of leadership? Is there a culture of wanting to change? Is there a culture of examining and reflecting on practice? And finally, facilitation, that that can't be uh, in any way overlooked or underestimated, that that's facilitation, not only from an external point of view, in terms of providing credible uh, sources of information, but also how do you then promote internal facilitation as well to keep a sustainable uh, practice change going. So all these elements of what we kind of started to explore in developing this type of program so that basically you know we weren't coming up with it on the back of a, a napkin or anything that it actually had a little bit of a, a strong background. So off we went and we started to try and explore the evidence and there's some really good work that's done by Bywood, Luna and Roach that has done a whole kind of examination of implementing AOD practice and training quite a large piece of work, <laughs> takes a lot to get through, but what they came to a summary of was that those types of educational activities like workshops, those sorts of things are what is 
is uh, generally a, a very good way of doing that, but doing it in a way that also supports ongoing partnership, and I'll talk about more about that in a, in a little bit. I found a lot of evidence and a lot of um, really well done large training needs analysis surveys on the alcohol and drug specialist or field. Couldn't really find anything about the other agencies that uh, what are their particular needs in terms of training. And we also wanted to, from an evidence point of view, if we're going to get evidence that is going to work, that's going to be accepted by uh, frontline workers, we needed to engage them in the discussion as well. So because we found that the cookie jar was pretty empty in relation to the uh, literature around what is it that non-government agencies who are not sort of funded or have an AOD response as part of their uh, suite of services, we decided to do a little bit of work initially then to fill that cookie jar as much as we could um, with the resources that we had. So we collected data from about, uh, we invited and collected data from about 25 agencies for a couple of months last year. This isn't all the agencies we've worked with, but this is a group of 25 that we used for an initial training needs survey. That gives you a bit of a distribution, distribution of the uh, primary focus group or the, uh, the type of clients and the type of uh, programs that we went to across the Logan community, just 25 agencies. We've worked with about 40 at this stage. And from that, we found some differences in what was coming out from the training needs surveys from AOD agencies versus the non-government. Unsurprisingly, within the specialist AOD field, we were seeing these types of um, top three about what were the uh, frontline workers expressed training needs. And in some ways, not unsurprisingly, these were the types of things that we were seeing coming up from that little piece of work that we did, working, getting feedback from 125 frontline workers across 25 agencies with quite a, quite a mix of target client groups. In some ways that doesn't uh, sort of stand out other than we didn't have this kind of information before that we could uh, reliably develop a program and its objectives on. But there's some more nuances to this as well because, okay, people want to know how to refer. Big deal in a way. But uh, I was um, very much challenged, particularly from my background, to work then in a way that was looking at themes that were coming from this data rather than just looking at things like frequency information and what was coming up to the top. So we did a bit of a thematic analysis on that data as well. And this is where the nuances come in, I guess, that give us a bit more of a richer tapestry and a richer picture of what it is that agencies are after in this field, in this space of uh, non-specialist uh, non AOD services. And what we found was a very strong, two very strong themes around, yes, they want to know about referral services, but it's not because I just want to pass my client on. It's because I actually want to be able to step up and help. I really want to have the capacity, I have a willingness to respond. It's to a point, I don't want to become a drug and alcohol clinician, but I recognize these are issues and I want to be able to help my clients, which is the second major theme. And again, it wasn't wanting to become uh, specialist drug and alcohol clinicians, but within the larger agenda of their goals as workers within their service, whether it be mental health, whether it be child and family support, they wanted to be able to improve the outcomes in line with that agenda and in line with those goals. So that had a lot of meaning for us, I guess in a way about how we approach training, that we were going to a group that was uh, motivated and keen and that wanted some skills, but didn't want the whole package of being able to take people all the way to the end. But how do we get them started was the clear message, because they were certainly seeing it as an issue. So from that little foray into that element of evidence of that implementation framework, the parish framework that we were using, what we decided to do was rather than have, I guess, uh, come together workshops, a bit like we're doing today, we decided to actually target ourselves in a way that we would go in-house to different organisations and agencies. And, and we had a bit of a luxury of doing this in that this was uh, funding that was kind of allocated to do it, but 
When we get to the end, I want to talk about how this might be done in a more micro way. It doesn't have to be a big thing. So that we could go to agencies that we could try and work with their agenda, I guess, around what they were trying to achieve. We created two fairly kind of um, broad-based core component workshops around some of that introductory, introductory information to alcohol and drug, but a lot of that is very interactive and client-driven around what the needs of that agency are and then conducting a brief intervention. And we really underpin that because the strong themes coming through the needs analysis where we want to, we see this as an issue, we want to be able to raise it with people and we want to take them a step further. We don't want to take them all the way, but a step further. So the, I guess the fundamental uh, mechanics of what is motivational interviewing, which is about how to actually have conversations that don't raise defensiveness, that don't evoke uh, kind of people digging in, how I can actually do that in a way that's collaborative and respectful and uh, helps to create some ambivalence became the model of evidence that we felt in meeting the Paris framework would be best accepted and that's since come out in the evaluation data that that's being very well received. No great surprises there but uh, we could have assumed all this um, as opposed to actually doing it the other way around. Next, the context. I guess this is where, because we've decided we probably need to go to agencies to be able to target their specific needs and agendas, we needed to set up some processes to understand and not make assumptions about the communities uh, of workers and communities of clients that those workers were working with. So we set up a process of uh, engaging in key informant consultations that usually was, some, was with somebody in management position uh, or some sort of supervisory position to get them on board and uh, we've since found that after a couple of about six months of operation we're now having a lot of approaches to us which is I guess a very good good outcome to get that um, onboarding and to help to understand some of the inner context and to get some of that I guess uh, more higher level support but because we didn't want to just stop there in terms of understanding the inner context of the, uh, the groups that we were going to, we, we d developed just using an online survey tool, a very short little needs analysis, a continuation of what we'd already done in that uh, pre-development stage. And this we send out to work to the workforce with an invitation, it's all voluntary, to tell us you know, how important is this issue in terms of uh, uh, what it is you want to do, is it a priority for the clients you work with, as well as what are your main challenges. So while we've got core content in our workshops, we tailor each workshop based on what those responses are and challenges that come up. So what we've added, been able to do from, uh, I guess, addressing that element of the implementation framework is to be able to do these meetings to get a lot of um, tailored content and quite tailored direction about how to best meet this particular community of workers' needs with the overall goal of how that helps the clients they work with. And it increases buy-in um, in a very big way. And finally, in terms of that external internal facilitation, obviously we're coming as an external facilitator. So what we've tried to do is make sure that that's resourced in a way that is uh, able to be adaptable and flexible because it's about different agencies' needs different groups they're working with, some common themes but a lot of uh, clear differences as well. As well as we wanted to set up a model where we would be able to do post training support. So it wasn't just kind of fly in, fly out. How could we stick around to help that implementation of and uh, skills acquisition and skills and knowledge transfer? So our original plan, which has since changed, it changed, I'll talk about that later, but what our original plan was, was to offer those agencies and invite them to engage in post-training support time limited where we would do sort of group supervision sessions, problem solving, the more stuff about how did you go with this, has it worked, where have been the barriers, where have been the challenges. So that was offered to, uh, that was going to be offered to all the agencies that we worked with. So that became part of our whole model as well. So that's what we launched off with. Um, sort of middle, about July last year. And what we've done since then, during the period July to May, is that we have been able to work, work with about 40 organisations. And uh, we've had close to 100 workshops. I'm aiming to get that to 100 and I'd like to do that very soon and have another cake because we, we do that. <laughs> um, 
upwards, it's about 380 participants now that we've worked with and uh, we've recruited a, there's a research project running alongside of this, some of the data I'll give you that's the preliminary, but we've got about 280 people. Where we've lost 100 people there is uh, where agencies within the time frame that we collected our sample have not completed both workshops because we offer it as a one day package or a split two day with a bit of flexibility around that. Also where we've um, helped our colleagues within Queensland Health and other mental health uh, units as well, I've taken them out because they're not representative of the non-government and we're trying to keep this research around that area. So basically what we decided to do, because again, literature, there's a lot of literature about alcohol and drug training. There's not necessarily a lot of literature around the impact of that. There's some really good, good work. But what we wanted to do was start to look at uh, a range of factors to see were we actually implementing things in a way that was causing innovation or creating innovation. And we've just got a long way to go on that, preliminary findings today, but um, so far things are going reasonably well. So those types of, I guess, attitudinal factors we measured because we were looking at a couple of things like role theory, Shaw's role theory in particular, which looks at that feedback loop that if people have increased sense of adequacy or confidence and increased sense of legitimacy, that that's more likely to create a willingness to respond and that that then creates better outcomes for clients. So we're looking at those sort of factors. We were wanting to look at, I guess, this field and, and how were the views, the personal views around that in terms of anything that might be a particular challenge. And because we were particularly interested that training was relevant and would potentially lead to practice change, immediately post-training, we wanted to look at those perceived levels of was it useful, not just did you like the biscuits, that sort of stuff. People still tell me about that though. We don't ask those questions. <laughs> and um, perceived usefulness as well as perceived relevance because we were really targeting ourselves to try and be uh, relevant to the workforce and the agencies. So we, other factors we have picked up on measured that I'll present very briefly and then get to kind of the learnings. We wanted to look at activity. So were we actually seeing in a, it's a short, fairly short time frame. We, we've only, we're measuring sort of three months post the training. Uh, and we've, our response rate at the moment is around 24-25%. So, and we've still got a, a little ways to go to collect the data, so it's only preliminary at the moment. We wanted to look at, did we affect those things like raising the issue in terms of that there's actually more activity of approaching this issue with clients where it's indicated? Were we seeing more types of um, intervention, as in a conversation that might be a facilitative conversation around change? And were we seeing then that translating into referral. And from a qualitative perspective, we wanted to look at, okay, what were the components of the training that were helpful? Where could we approve and any barriers to implementation? So if we told you these things, were they practical? And if they weren't, why was that the case? So what have we found so far? I've been let loose and discovered how to do radar graphs on Excel recently, but I like them because they can be a little bit narrative and tell a story. These two I'll just go through very quickly, the first two. This is the stuff where we measure, and we're using the National Centre for Education Training on Addictions Work Practice Questionnaire, which is specifically designed around measuring outcomes from alcohol and drug training. This is looking at, okay, was the training useful in that immediate post sense at the end of a workshop? And in terms of those items within that scale, it's a six item scale around things like confidence, Did it was it useful in terms of helping me be able to deliver new skills, will it improve my responses, will it improve team responses. We're getting quite high uh, responses at that point. But of more interest to me was the relevancy scale, I guess, around, because that's kind of how we were pitching ourselves and the, the, uh, the main, one of the main objectives of what we want, wanting to do was to be relevant to the agencies and their needs. And we're finding that we're getting, again, those really high, sort of above 95% kind of satisfaction ratings in relation to being, it's appropriate to my role, um, it's consistent with what I do, it's not too far removed, and um, I will use these skills and be able to have practical application. But again, this is in that lovely little afterglow period um, when you finish the training and you've bribed people with chocolate all the way through, which is one of our other strategies. <laughs> Let's look at, uh, I guess, what else we do. What we wanted to know a little bit more about was about impact. So three months later, how are we travelling with these work groups? 
and I said our response rate, which I'm discovering is the bane and limitation of every researcher, tends to um, go down no matter how, you know, no matter how much begging and pleading you do. But uh, again, using radar graphs, looking at the pre-post, so baseline before we start the training and then three months later. This is on this scale of role adequacy, that I actually could respond is basically the kind of underpinning question to this one and the items going around there. This is where we're having the biggest impact at the moment that we're finding. And then if you look at the theory, the feedback loop, how that translates into practice, is, um, is, is there's quite a strong link there. So where we're having the strongest, I guess, impact in is in terms of increase, increasing that confidence level of knowledge and um, I guess in terms of uh, feeling competent in their role. That for the statistical people, which is, I'm a bit of a numbers guy, is showing levels of significance with a fairly strong um, kind of factor around um, its uh, you know, usefulness in terms of effect size, about a 0.6% effect size. Role legitimacy, which is um, not I could respond, but more of that stuff around I should respond. It's actually a legitimate part of my role to be asking these questions. Remember, we're going to a lot of agencies whose funding agenda or other agenda is not necessarily uh, purely written down as drug and alcohol. The nice thing here, and I'll speak to this in a few moments, but the nice thing here is that we're getting initially high levels of role legitimacy in non-alcohol non and drug specialist agencies. We're seeing that coming in on about a 20 points on a 28 point scale. Certainly from the training, where we're seeing, we're seeing some increases in this kind of domain and this uh, variable that we're measuring, where we're seeing it is in terms of I feel less uncertain that it's actually a part of my role to be able to do something. It's fairly clear I should do it. And that uh, we're not seeing any sort of negative responses. In terms of motivational and reward, which is that anticipated stuff, which is about it's going to, it's, uh, I anticipate that it's going to be a good thing for me to do this, that I enjoy doing it, that I'm going to get satisfaction, that scale. Nicely again, probably the thing that speaks to me here is because we, we haven't had a lot of impact here, it's still coming up as significant in terms of uh, being unlikely to have resulted by chance with a moderate effect size of about 0.38 there. What we're seeing is that there's really initially quite high levels of uh, sense of motivation or anticipated motivation and satisfaction that working with drug and alcohol and people experiencing the harms associated with it is, is rewarding. And I love that the importance, we have done nothing in relation to making it important, but that's okay because it was pretty high at the beginning. Um, which is really nice because you read a lot of the research, unfortunately, um, and nothing against my nursing colleagues, but nurses and GPs come out, whoop, sorry Karen, um, come out very, <laughs> a lot of surveys come out quite low with, um, not for people who work in the drug and alcohol field, but in the broader sense. But what we're finding out there within our non-government uh, colleagues, uh, and I th my theory is it comes from a very strong social justice framework, which underpins probably those agencies a little bit more sometimes than what we see in government. but. Those sorts of things. We're still coming in significant there. We're having in fact in terms of that it's satisfying working in this field. Um, people aren't still necessarily liking it. Um, that's, uh, that's what we found through this looking at the story represented here. But at least it's still important is the main thing. And we haven't, uh, we've actually slightly decreased this idea that it should be somebody else's job. That refer question, the asterisk stands for it's a reverse coded item on the scale. So it's kind of a, a backwards kind of reflection there, but it's basically saying that it's somebody else's job to do this. And uh, in terms of these variables that we're me measuring, these attitudinal ones, we also wanted to know a little bit about what were the personal views or the stuff that's about negative stereotypes. And again, this is a reverse scale, so getting smaller in terms of the blue is better, but it was really low to begin with. So very low level of negative stereotypes and negative stigmatising type views held amongst this community of workers in relation to people experiencing drug and alcohol harm. But what I like there is we've also had the biggest impact with some significance, they're probably now getting towards more of a low effect size. Where we've had the impact is in that, on that item that measures 
I think the question is something like that people with drug and alcohol issues bring it on themselves. Um, we do a little bit in the training trying to look at those broader models, particularly bring in a bit of the neuroscience, <coughs> looking at the stuff where, you know, choices that turn into compulsions and the unintended consequences uh, of a lot of sort of the biocycle and social factors. So we've seen, where we've seen the biggest decrease is potentially in maybe that type of view being held, um, which again, if you look at the feedback loops, creates uh, then uh, necessarily, it creates then a more momentum for people to want to engage because the, the sense of hopelessness tends to decrease. I won't worry about that one, but um, in terms of activity, because again, the real question here is about do we see practice change? This at the moment is, um, I'm, we're not sure. We're seeing a slight increase here, but not a major one in terms of those areas around that uh, from baseline to three month follow up post training, that uh, how frequent in the last three months have I experienced uh, or actually undertaken an activity of approaching or being willing and to raise an issue with a client that I've actually delivered some sort of um, conversational style interaction that's been about looking at issues and focusing on change or that I have referred into treatment. Those at the moment are showing a slight increase, certainly not reaching levels of significance at the moment. We've still got a ways to go and we're not really sure if that means we're doing necessarily a good or a bad job. So what we've done is to go a little bit further and um, just before I do talk about why, how we're going further in this sort of assessment, just wanted to also let you know Another little thing we did, that's just a whole lot of numbers that look ugly, but basically the numbers aren't too different to the left or the right column. We're looking at all our average scale scores and uh, activity scores there. All this was to do was to measure, did we have any difference if we split the training over different days to meet organisational, to be flexible, because we're trying to actually work with agencies and partner with them in a way that's relevant and helpful. Was there any difference between doing a training on one day and different days? The answer is no. So no great effect size there, no great difference. So do it in three sessions, maybe, um, if, if we need to. We also looked at some of the qualitative feedback. What were the components that people were finding the most useful? And we had our implementation intent around that we wanted to do this in a way that was had some evidence that was focusing on the, the uh, components of things like being contextual and relevant as well as providing good facilitation and fortunately that's the sort of thing that we've got back that facilitation probably is coming out as number one as being one of the most valued components in terms of not just you know who's out front but just in terms of the ability to uh, be adaptable and flexible around making the training relevant not only in the pre-workshop phase but also during the actual delivery that people are able to ask questions, make it interactive, relate it back to their needs and their current circumstances. The information on alcohol and drug, but that's again a little bit more nuanced around that each workshop is tailored. So what people are finding is the, the fact that we're able to go in, give this specific, I guess, information that may relate to things to be aware of in a domestic violence type program setting versus a mental health program. Some of them overlap but there's also some very subtle differences as well. The tools and resources, so that really comes down to things like the tools and res resources we're using un that are underpinned by a motivational interviewing approach. So again, our intent was to use evidence that would be accepted, that people would be okay with, and we're finding that we're getting that sort of feedback from uh, not only our immediate post training, but at our three month, that these things are what are valued and in fact, in our three month follow up, the skills that people are implementing that they're most talking about is the ability to actually raise the issue, a greater level of confidence, a greater level of comfort and be able to do that. So where we go to from here, because we're not sure about that activity stuff, we really want to be transparent here, we want to know more. So we've got a tertiary partner on board now, the Department of Sociology up at UQ, and uh, we'll be unleashing a crack A team of six third year social science students in semester two this year who will pick a sample from our 40 agencies and go out and do fairly in-depth focus interviews. They're currently doing their methodology around that and coming up with their questions and they're now asking us questions, <laughs> which um, is uh, always good uh, from our side of things. And what they're going to do is look deeper into what were the, uh, the strengths and the gaps 
in relation to what we've been able to provide so far? Has it resulted in practice change through a, from a focus interview perspective? As well as we want to ask that other question about how is we as a service in this drug and alcohol area, if we're sitting kind of at, the, um, at that tier four level, how do we keep these effective partnerships going? How do we actually uh, keep that um, onboarding happening as we proceed? So there'll be more results hopefully once we get that information back. So what have we learned and, and what's the, I guess, the main objective of today is to probably share with any agency here, whether it be non-government, whether it be government agency, about <coughs> if this might be something that could be considered in your regions or areas of uh, wanting to partner with maybe a small number of agencies to do some capacity building. What have we learned so far and why would we promote this as being something that would be useful? So on the data that we've learned so far, I'd really like to suggest that um, there's a real opportunity for partnership because what we're finding, and I don't think it's whilst we've only been operating in Logan, I take this as a fairly good sample given that we've got a large number of agencies that we're working with uh, groups that are fairly consistently federally or state funded um, in terms of their client group and their target groups, but that they are very willing partners that what we're seeing from our results is initially quite high levels of role legitimacy as well as high levels of motivation and reward. And if you look into the implementation and the training science literature, both of those, and in fact, it kind of shows that if you've got that, training doesn't affect it very much, maybe a little bit, but if you've got that, then you've got the necessary conditions for actually improving responses by just a little bit of support, by education, and then support to the organisation on an ongoing basis. In fact, the literature kind of says that if you've got low, low levels, the role theory literature suggests if you've got low levels on both of those kind of areas before training, it actually gets worse after training, which is um, just an indication that uh, sometimes views are fixed and that training can be perceived as, try, as, as a bit of a, an agenda to try and um, change me. So people have a digging response to that. But uh, what we're finding very much in this sector is that there's a lot of willingness, a lot of desire to step up is probably the way I would put it. What we've been able to find as well through our thematic analysis of all the data we're getting back is that there's a strong awareness of issues, but then there's a, um, a concern about not, wanting to, not knowing how to step up or a bit of fear as well, which is not, understand, uh, not about clients, but just how to do it properly. And also a real desire to want to step up, as I said, but, but to a point, we want to be able to raise this issue. We want to be able to get people to desire to reach out and maybe step into other help. So that might be a referral into a specialist service or anything like that. But there's a desire to get things going, if you like. And the other thing I would suggest from this type of information and as a key learning for us is that at some point, if you're going to go down this path, the question will come up, in an environment sometimes of scarce funding and scarce resources about whether this should be something that you charge for. And that's come up in our team, not often, once or twice, but probably the best response I heard to this was actually from a finance person, and uh, which is interesting, was that if you're going to chase a few hundred dollars for the potential value of developing partnership, don't, don't do it, basically. Um, but that's just one of our learnings for the benefits that you may get. In terms of the Not Drug 101, the, uh, I guess the kind of the leading title for this, that's the other side of it, is that what we've discovered thematically and practically and in the challenges and in the workshops about what people are really kind of wanting to soak up is not just the information about what drugs do. A little bit of the pharmacology stuff, a little bit of, you know, what's out there, what's new, but that's not the real guts of it. In fact, the real guts of it is that what they actually want to know is, I've got these people out here who are having these issues. They've been ref they're here because of those types of issues, whether it be DV, whether it be because there's um, youth-related issues, child and family support. I want to help them improve that part of their life. Drug and alcohol is a part of it. How do I actually do that? How do I actually engage it? How do I actually get the help-seeking behaviour and promote those sides of things? So a lot of the... Um, the training is got to be tailored in terms of the context of that. To be able to understand the issues that might be 
related to the um, impact of drug and alcohol or how it might fit into, I guess, those broader issues that people are experiencing. And very much that um, facilitation needs to be able to adapt to that on the run because what's going to be happening, when you, particularly when you go to an organisation, and I'll speak to this in a few moments, but um, it's a little bit like here. Everybody in this room today is very well behaved because maybe we've come from all different agencies and we don't know each other. You go to an organisation where they already know each other, a lot more verbose, <laughs> a lot more interactive, a lot more wanting to know, okay, I've got these issues, I've got these clients, we're facing this, what do we do? This type stuff. So you can get as much of that information, but you never get all of it up front. It's going to happen on the day, so it needs to be responded to in that sense. So it's not just about what drugs do in the body and the brain. The other, I guess, key learning and that we found, and again, this isn't brand new for, um, for anyone who knows implementation science, is that being able to work within an organisation in terms of allows you to, and, and opens up your ability to influence organisational culture about how do we do things around here. And by that I mean just the practical mechanics of being able to get a whole team, staff team together because that's what uh, we found and we would like to suggest as a key learning from these, this initiative is if you can actually get not only the managers but the workers and even the admin staff together and that's what we've been able to do in these types of workshops. We certainly promote it, we don't always get it, but we usually get a lot of buy-in. It doesn't just have to be your clinician or equivalent type people. Getting all the people together allows you to be able to start to problem solve issues around if we are going to implement different practice in terms of the workflow, who could be involved, how is that achieved, how can we start to send consistent messages right from when a person rings up to the types of pictures that we might have in our waiting rooms to the types of things we might put in our newsletters, if that's the admin person's responsibility, that might send a message out there to people coming to our service that it's okay to talk about drug and alcohol at this issue, at this service, that it's not a forbidden topic, that it's not uh, people aren't going to fall off their chairs if I, if I mention it. How do we start to get that message out there? And having a whole of teams together allows you to have those conversations. Um, and it's always different suggestions come up, some of the same sort of stuff comes up, but uh, allowing teams to work on that together has been uh, one of the benefits, I guess, or one of the differences from getting a lot of diverse people together. They both have their strengths, but being able to look at that organisational culture. The other thing it tends to do, and um, organisational culture does, if you look at the literature, has an ability to influence personal views more than training does on its own. So if you can start to get at the organisational cultural level within a training, it has an ability to kind of pull people together and get them all on the same page. The other thing that we would suggest from our learning comes a bit from the literature, also from practical application, is that it's, it's not, we tried not to do just a train and hope approach, which is basically fly in, fly out, but to stick around. But that's had its challenges. Um, Again, going back to Sam Levinson's quote, you know, don't, uh, life's too short to make all the mistakes on our own. This is where we found it's not been a huge mistake, but where something that we tried didn't work particularly well. So what I mean by that is that we wanted to make sure that we've got a model that builds in that post-training support. Because if you, if you look again at the models, the stuff that helps people to implement practice is not only education, not only actually having a go and an experience, but having peer or collegial or organisational support ongoing when I'm actually trying new things, tends to create more practice innovation. So what we tried to do, and our original great plan was, okay, any organisation we work with will offer them to be able to go back and work with um, either that group or a subset of that group to do effectively, we were calling it kind of like, a, I think we're calling it mentoring um, in the beginning, to help that cement that knowledge transfer and skills acquisition. It hasn't worked or it didn't work. Uh, why we think it didn't work is because it's just basically a logistics thing. Agencies are busy. And uh, having a lead-in time for training for a couple of, usually it's a couple of months, about two to three months once you start having these initial consults with agencies, it's easy to book out a day or to kind of get everybody collected around that sort of activity. To do this more kind of shorter, one-hour problem-solving mentoring group we found that we weren't able to get that stuck. 
in, in, in get that going, get any traction with it. And it wasn't because there people people were asking for it, people were open to it, they were agreeing to it, but then to actually logistically, practically get it happening didn't work. So we flipped a bit and we changed and we've created a different model, which is in its infancy at the moment, where we ask agencies if they've got an interested person to be nominated and join into a professional learning circle where we have a time limited series of meetings once a month and we focus on problem solving specific issues or targeting particular training interventions. So we've got one of those going at the moment um, with a desire to expand. So we get people from diverse agencies which has its benefits as well in terms of that cross fertilization that goes on and um, it's usually interested in motivated people so we tend to get the meetings happening. So to guess, I guess to sum all that up in terms of a couple of recommendations around the original intent that I was expressing before, to maybe uh, put this in the context of agencies out there who may be those who have a greater level of knowledge around alcohol and drug, and who maybe have some capacity and who are working in communities or regions, and uh, that's pretty much most communities and regions at the moment where people are experiencing, people and their families are experiencing alcohol and drug related harm is that uh, it might be something for consideration. From our learnings, it sounds like we've done a kind of a whole lot of work. It doesn't necessarily need to be that. The type of model we're suggesting would be one that probably has some good preliminary evidence behind it. We'll go further and do the research and do a paper up and all that sort of stuff to kind of cement that. But it might be that uh, agencies have the capacity at the moment in a annual operational plan to target one or two NGOs that they currently closely work with. And this is probably already happening. There's probably pieces of this already happening, so I'm not assuming it isn't. But just putting it on the table to encourage the idea. To be able to maybe do some training, because this is a willing group. I don't think Logan is in any way uh, a non-representative sample of these agencies. If, if we're going to do that, uh, to do it in a way that actually under engages first to understand what their actually needs are. And uh, that's the Not Drugs 101 um, message. And to provide that training, not an in-service, don't know about you guys, but I've been to so many sort of like in-services or other agencies that just talk about what they do and I come out and I still really don't know what people do. To actually kind of make it about, not even just so much a little bit of information about drugs, but what people really want is to know how to actually uh, raise, recognise and raise this, is the key skills that people want to be able to do. And that comes from a very, I guess, well-intentioned space that's already there. We don't have to go looking for it. If you're going to do it to use experienced staff, not just give it to the new person, um, only because what agencies are looking for to make things credible is the ability to be able to apply, not just post-training, but to talk about issues in out of application within training. No great surprises here. And to also look at not just the fly-in, fly-out, train and hope approach, but to <coughs> see if there's capacity to resource a little bit of ongoing educational work. Because again, role theory would suggest that things like adequacy, confidence and legitimacy increase when people have access to support, whether it be through colleagues, peers, or other organisations. So it doesn't have to be formal, it doesn't have to be of a model of those learning circles or learning communities that we've, we're trialling at the moment. It could just be that ability to be checking in with agencies, to have those open lines of communication. Because we have both. It's lovely now, we get a lot of emails from agencies we've worked with, some of it agencies we worked with last year, who are now starting to ask us, come back, ask us questions, because they're facing issues, challenges. Uh, presenting with clients. I've got my contact details there, but uh, I guess where we're going to lead to now is to open up to um, any questions or queries or doubtful points. Who did the training, James? Who did you and your colleague? Predominantly, yes. Correct. Okay, just yes. the two of you. Yeah, okay. predominantly me, but uh, yeah, that's been... Um, our focus because that's also then been about keeping that relationship going through to the, the 
the learning communities that we have post the training and also contact as well. Thank you. Um, was there any different findings that you didn't predict in this research? Or was there anything surprising that you thought, wow, I didn't expect that to happen or come out of the data? Uh, probably so far, and it's all been very nice for, for, for us and, and for me in particular, is that um, if I was to sum that question up with something that was a reasonable answer, I think all I would need to do is do training on how to have conversations around what people find to be sensitive topics or where workers maybe have some anxiety. If all we did was training around that and left the drugs out, that would be enough um, because that's what people are really wanting. Uh, a little bit about the drugs, and, but that's such a small component um, around what people want. I guess the, um, the other thing that I found is uh, uh, unexpectedly was probably the level of willingness to engage. But where the, a key and a, a sobering learning has been as well is that uh, the drug and alcohol, sorry, the drug and alcohol for the issue of drug and alcohol or the topic of drug and alcohol has, you've got to go with an approach that actually puts it in place on that agency's agenda. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be the biggest thing for them, which is part of my theory around why the mentoring didn't work, hasn't worked very well, because at the time of doing a training, oh, here's a PD opportunity and it's free, and also we can organise that fairly easily by blocking people's diaries out, that works really well and the trainings are quite robust and, and um, good in that regard to what people get from them. But then afterwards, I'm working with my clients and my focus is here and drug and alcohol is in there, but it's not the biggest thing on my agenda. So the type of training we have to do has to kind of respect that very much, that uh, people have, they've got a lot of other focuses and a lot of other competing demands. So, yeah. Probably the other finding, which is not so much in the research, is that there's a lot of misinformation out there <laughs> and uh, held by people in the field. Mm -hmm. Not, not in any way from an, a, a negative or a biased point of view, just from messages that are quite popularist and in the mainstream. And it's nice to kind of work with that and, uh, yeah, uh, help that change. <laughs>